Greetings, Stars fans, and welcome to the Two Brothers Mic'd Up show. If you didn't know, we have a game of NHL going on in the background as we give our thoughts and discussion on the recent Dallas Stars game. Dallas Stars played the St. Louis Blues in Game 70. As we start off each episode, we go back to the last episode. We give our predictions towards the end, so always stick around. Quinn, you liked a score of 4-3 to three for Dallas and a 3-2 to two score for uh, St. Louis. I like to score a 4-2 to two for Dallas and 5-3 to three for the Blues. Again, I hit on one of those, but it was the 5 uh, score because last episode I had a 5-4 win for the Stars. This one, the Stars lose 5-4. to four. So, the... The game is underway. You see Niemi is in net. Thoughts on that? Well, I mean, it's always good to give your goaltender a rest, especially during back-to-backs. You don't want him getting tired, especially going into the playoffs. So I, I think it was overall the probably the best call. I know a lot of people wanted to see Lettinen in net because he is the hot goaltender. But in a back-to-back, you know, you usually want to go with the fresh goalie try and get the win. Yeah, you don't want to overplay Kari. I mean, Kari has... We've seen when Kari has played too much towards down the end of the stretch, his play begins to diminish. And he just seems like... Kari is not built for playing 70 games. He's done it before. I mean, I think his season high might be like 68. But... We always see Kari starting to break down towards the end of the season. Let's let the dude have some rest. This is what Niemi was brought in for. This is why he has that big contract. He's supposed to come in on these back-to-backs to try to give us the best chance to win. Now, you know what? I'd much rather have Niemi in instead of like the last like six backups we've had for this uh, Dallas Stars team. I mean, Niemi has given Lettinen the sort of backstop that we need. Granted, he is not playing as of great, you know, as of late, but still, he's still a capable goaltender of being able to get some wins. And he's proved that, that he can win games. And in this game, he was making big stops. Like, this game could have easily have been like 8-4. to four. If uh, Nemi didn't make some of those big saves that he did, granted he gave up some soft goals. But you know what? This this goaltending tandem, it's not just Nemi, it's Kari as well. They're both susceptible to giving up soft goals. Yeah, I've, I've been, I noticed a lot, especially last night in the subreddit for Dallas Stars, that everybody is just... Oh, screw Niami, Niami, you suck. Why do we have, why do we have Niami on this team? Why can't we trade him and all that stuff? But if you go back to the beginning of the season, Niami is the one that was making us win. Yeah. Kari was the bad goaltender. So if you're I don't know why y'all are saying Niami sucks and he shouldn't be on this team because without Niami, we we're probably last place or close to it. You know, he was the goaltender that kept us in our winning, what, like 30 games in a row or what it seems like. You know, he was the goaltender in net. Yeah, I mean, towards the beginning, middle of the season, it was was all the talk of, ugh, why is Kari playing? Why isn't Niemi playing? Because Kari was, or Niemi was seeming to establish that he was going to be the number one and then... Kari was going to come in relief, but, you know, this recent stretch after the All-Star break, neither goaltender has really taken hold of the number one spot because we'd see Niemi go on like a three-game stretch of good, and then he'd fall off, and then Kari is now back on his good side, and he had a really good game against the Hawks uh, on on, uh, Friday, sorry, Um, but... The way this goaltending tandem is set up is that they need rest. You know, Niemi has had, you know, I think he had like 12 days off and was still giving up soft goals, but 
again, you have to look at is that the last, like, three backup goaltenders, I think they have three wins total, maybe two. Like, our backup goaltenders could not win at all. And it was once we, once Kari was not in the net, it was a loss, no matter what. But with Niemi, there's still this kind of hope, but, and, you know, but the team has to play good around him. The team ultimately has to play good around him. Just like we got good team defense with Kari last night. Because you know what? The Hawks could have stomped us if they wanted to. But we played good team defense. The team defense did not show up for this one. It wasn't bad. But it we didn't have the same effort as we did against the Hawks. You know, we didn't apply the pressure and the force that we did against the Hawks. Because, granted, you can't really do that against St. Louis because they are bigger, stronger. But you have to play a different type of style. But I think if you had played the same way against Chicago, you would have had the same results against St. Louis. Because once you start playing St. Louis style hockey, the Ken Hitchcock style hockey, you're going to lose. You know, there's 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 really no way of getting around it unless you're using your speed and your skill around it and not letting them take the body on you. The stars did uh, counter punch a bit towards like the end of the game. I think in the the middle stretch in the second period, the Blues started running over us. We started turning the pucks over again, which is a theme with the Dallas Stars, as they have a high turnover rate or a give over or giveaway rate and it just seems that once they start getting a little frazzled they start getting a little hurried and that started happening in the second period but let's go down the the scores of the game we have Troy Brower in the first period we have Cody Eakin in the first Tarasenko Spezza and two from Shattenkirk in the second period and we have one from Jason Spezza and one from Jamie Benn on the power play. So that's... Ben now has two goals in two games. Uh, which is good to see. Going to the, the Troy Brower uh, goal. What did you see on the defensive side of that? Uh, we, got, we got back into puck watching. I mean... I mean, it, there's really no other way to put it. I mean, the defense just kind of, just kind of stopped playing. Uh, Johns, you know, he's he's the odd one out. You know, Troy Brower shoots an innocent puck at Niami. Niami doesn't cradle it, and it just comes right back out. Johns is facing the other way and looking for the puck, and Troy Brower gets a perfect slam dunk. So, I mean, could have been played a little bit better defensively. Yeah, uh, the way the way that Johns plays the puck, I had no problem with. He he takes the pass away. He's getting in a lane. You know, I think a lot of that falls on to Niemi because his rebound control has been kind of subpar for the past couple of starts that he's been in. Uh, and then he ultimately loses sight of the puck. And Troy Brower follows up his own rebound. And he's able to just deposit it into just a wide open net. Now you had Alish Hemsky coming back. But he was taking away the man that Brower could ultimately pass to. Which I didn't have a problem with Hemsky taking that play either. I think Hemsky did the right play of sticking with that man to try to... You know, bring down the percentage of getting a pass over. I think if that pass gets over, it's an open net either way. But ultimately, I think Niemi has to do a better job with his rebound control. It's a bit of a softy, but Stars uh, bounce back. You know, like four minutes later, we have Cody Eakin catching a pass in stride, going in on a breakaway and putting it top cheese on the backhand. I think that's the prettiest backhand we'll see well besides Fiddler's backhand yeah, I was about to say I think uh, Fiddler still still owns that but uh, you know Eakin catching it in stride and it getting through both 
of the Blues defensemen. Not sure what they were doing. I think Razor kind of pointed it out. It's like they were probably doing, you got it? No, I got it. You got it? You got it? And then he can ultimately catch the pass from Ben. You know, Ben continues his primary assist streak. I think this is like, has to be like seven games in a row where he's getting like primary assists. And that's been able to keep him in the stride in points and he's producing, just hasn't been able to get on the goal sheet. But it was a good goal. Yeah, from, I, think, I think Eakin was making up for that breakaway he completely whiffed on in the Chicago game. Yeah. But the one thing that I don't like from Jamie Benn is he gets that breakaway. And then he goes in so nonchalant. Like, I understand if it's like the, the shootout and you want to go in slow and do like a Patrick Kane and try to, to mesmerize the goaltender with like stick handling to try to deke him out and stuff like that. But there's real no, there's no complicated stick handling. There's no move. Jamie Benn just slows down and lets Jake Allen anticipate where he's going. I mean, it looked like Jamie Benn was staring blocker the whole way. Didn't try any kind of deception. Didn't try anything like that. But I think that's... And that's been a common thing with uh, Jamie this season, is once he gets, like, a breakaway, it's no, like, full steam ahead. It's no, you know, I'm going to power through the goaltender with some speed, and I'm going to make... Even if I make the first move, the goaltender is going to be too slow to react. It's it's the I'm gonna slow down and try to pick the uh, the spot that I want to go, and it's up to the goaltender to see if he's gonna stop it. And he and he does most of the time. It's it's kind of infuriating to see him just slow down. You know, if he goes any slower, the St. Louis Blues uh, back checker gets him. Uh, but then we see that Russell break away, and then. <laughs> like Razor was saying, if that's the uh, if that's the strategy on Allen, they were sorely mistaken because no one was beating him blocker side. It just seemed like a bad thing for Jamie to slow down like he did. I I want to see some hustle because I mean, you saw Cody Eakin; his feet were moving the whole time. You know, it, speed is ultimately the best thing that you can give yourself the advantage. Especially Let's, because it makes the goaltender back up faster. It makes him think, well, he's skating in fast. You know, is he going to shoot or is he going to deke? Because he's got the speed to deke right now. But is he going to shoot? You know, the goalie starts questioning what he's going to do. The goalie starts getting in his head. But whenever, it, exactly like you said, when you slow down, and with a player like Jamie Benn, you know, He's more likely to shoot more than I think Deke because he has more, probably one of the best accurate shots in the league, and goalies kind of know that. So I feel like when he takes away all of his speed, like Jake Allen anticipates shot the entire way and ultimately wins. Yeah, and Jake Allen uh, kept the, the St. Louis Blues in this game because let's see, Dallas had 18 shots in the first period and then 12 in the second. They had 30 shots within two periods. But I wrote down that after the first period, all those missed chances that Dallas had, like the, the Roussel chance to name one, is I wrote down that that will ultimately come back to bite you in the ass. Because St. Louis, although... You know, they had 23 shots through uh, two periods. They were capitalizing on all of their chances. You know, they were getting the bounces. You can't really fault Niemi on the Tarasenko goal. I mean, it hits Oduya, and ultimately you're supposed to just kind of let... If that puck gets through, I think Niemi stops it and covers it. But the way that Niemi goes down and tries to anticipate the shot coming to him, once he anticipates that, the shot changes, and Niemi has to react to that. And Tarasenko's a world-class goal scorer. I think Tarasenko scores that, like, what, seven times out of ten? So it's like... Well, I mean, he has the same amount of goals as Sagan and Ben. Well, not so much Ben anymore, yeah. but... like he, So he's on the, the same level as our two best players. Yeah. So, like, 
look, it's it's kind of it's a softy, but man, you you have to think that Tarasenko had the majority of the chance to get that one. But in comes our savior, Spezza. He uh, he pots one in shortly after the pl uh, the power play from Sagan's shot that gets like deflected around and off the post, and then Spezza's there to just knock it into the open net. He continues to be the hottest Dallas star scorer that we've had in the past couple of weeks. I think that's six straight now. He's one off of the longest streak set by like Crosby and Kane by seven. I think Marshawn was in there too. But the the way that Spets is playing right now how all the Dallas Stars don't just watch him and see, look, if you just shoot, you take your chance, good things can happen. I think that's what uh, the coaching staff should be highlighting. It's like, look, don't try to overthink it. Jason Spezza just shoots it. Might not go in, but damn, if something pretty does not come out right, of it. Especially that, that slap shot that rings off the crossbar right to a spot where he likes it. Mm -hmm. Like, I think Spets is on a shoot first, ask questions later pace right now. So and that's paying dividends for him. So, like you said, I would like the other players to take note. Yeah, but then going off of the Spets uh, goal, I think, let's see, Spets scores like two minutes into the second period, but then we get the controversial uh, Foxa Upshaw penalties. Thoughts on that? Uh, should have been a power play. There's no way Foxa was holding him. You know, he's got his head stuck between a stick and he gets, like, choke slam. Like, I don't, I don't get what was going on in the ref's head when they said that Fox was holding him. You know, he's got both hands on his stick. I don't see where the hold was at. Yeah, it it definitely goes to show that just how bad the officiating has been this season. Now, people could say, oh, don't... You gotta rise above the officiating. You gotta, you know, both teams gotta play with it, but... When officiating takes over the momentum of the game, I think that's bad for both teams. And we see right here that that should have been a, a high stick call on Upshaw. And how, what, I mean, what is Foxa holding? He's holding, what, Upshaw's stick with his chin or something like that? I mean, I don't, I don't understand in the right mind. And again, if I was Lindy Ruff, I would be calling you know, front office of the NHL being like, hey, look at this play and you tell me where the penalty is. Just like the game before with Chicago with the goaltender interference. And tell me, I would call them and be like, look, tell me where there's not goaltender interference. You know, the, the officiating has just been bad for not just the Dallas Stars this season, but it's like league-wide with how bad the officiating has been this season and I'm not the only one that's you know trying to point it out like you go and watch uh, Steve Dangle on his uh, videos I mean he gives out really good descriptions of like refs being in the wrong positions for you know what happened in St. Louis you know it hits the ref in the skate and they get a goal right off of it I mean the way they officiate it like there has to be some kind of change in the off season for because you know what I'm actually kind of worried with playoffs right around the corner that it just it's not getting better. Yeah, and uh, I saw an example, another example of it could be considered bad officiating, but you know, from the angles, you know, you don't really get the whole story. But the Winnipeg game versus the Avalanche, you know, they're on the I think the Avalanche are on the power play. They shoot it in, hits off the post, and goes underneath Pavlik, and everybody's. Like, stick-checking the goalie, and it takes, like, three seconds for them to blow the whistle that never comes and ultimately gets a goal. And you see Bufflin just irate going after, <clears throat> excuse me, going after the referee, like, almost wanting to fight him because he didn't call it dead. 
Like, there's, like, three to five seconds where the play is just going on where he's got the puck covered. Like, I don't I don't know if the ref was like, oh, well, no, it's still loose or something, but officiating is just questionable this season. Yeah. And it's not to blame everything on officiating, because I guess that's what it could seem like from this segment right here, but ultimately, bad turnovers and goaltending is what... Uh, cost the Dallas Stars in this game. Uh, you know, the bad goaltending goes on the 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 third goal, Shattenkirk's first goal on his wraparound. Nimi bites too hard. He just overcommits and just ultimately bites too hard on that. Uh, you don't want to see Nimi and, and Nimi has in the his past couple of starts. You can see him overplaying. I mean, you saw it in uh, Phoenix when he was overplaying a lot. He Niemi has to get his timing down. He needs to, you know, start anticipating the play a bit better. Uh, but w- ultimately, what gives this game away is the the giveaways. Dallas had fourteen. St. Louis had four. That if you're gonna play like that chances are you're not going to win because you're turning it over in bad positions and you're not giving your goaltender much because it's happening in your own zone. It goes back to them not getting good uh, clears. They're not getting good uh, breakouts. They're not getting a lot of good things whenever they start hurrying themselves up and they start turning it over. Because once they start turning it over, it turns into just, it's an infection that just causes the whole thing to slow down but you know you get Shattenkirk's uh, second goal for St. Louis to go up to four goals but it, it goes off Stephen Johns's knee I believe can't really blame Niemi on that one in Johns is second game how'd you like his game from Chicago did it did it progress? Did it kind of stay the same? I, mean, or did I think it, 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 it kind of stayed the same which is not a bad thing you know, he's hitting people in Chicago. He's making good plays. He's and then you go to this game. He's hitting people and he's making good plays. You know, it's just unfortunate that he's out there for two goals that can't really be blamed on him. I mean, uh, he, well, the first one could, you know, if you want to look at it that way. But does it bother you at all that he f- finishes with a minus three? No, I mean. Even like some of the best goal, or best defenders, like look at Keith and Seabrook last game. You know, I'm pretty sure they finished with a bunch of minuses. The best defensemen are still subjected to who they play against, and overall, the best defensemen still get minuses. So, I'm not worried about it. I think he'll still progress and get better with each game he plays in. Yeah, the thing that I love when you go and you look at the stats. Who led this team in hits? Richie. No. Johns. Yeah. But it. you say Richie and then you go to Johns, the thing that I love is that Richie is out there and he he is the energy that Roussel should be giving. As Roussel finishes with one hit. All right, look, I, I don't want to keep harping on Roussel, but this is a game... The uh, Razor and Strader, during the Chicago game, they say Roussel raises his game when he plays against Chicago. He needs to raise his game against St. Louis. Look, Chicago, yes, you have to play your best, but you got to bring a big bag of knuckles whenever St. Louis comes into town or when you go into St. Louis because that is a mean team to play against. Finishing with one hit is not going to cut it. But Richie, Richie finishes with 10 minutes of ice time. 10 minutes. Do you know how underutilized that is for uh, Richie? I mean, Roussel finishes with, uh, with 16 minutes, almost 17. I would have much rather that been switched. I, even in the third period, whenever you see Richie hit Bo Meester, just a great hit. Why was he not... Look, I like Eves. I do. I, 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 I would not have a problem if he's on the team next season. 
but holy crap, why is Eves up on the first line? Okay, yeah. you want to start the game with Eves up there? Fine. But... You're seeing Richie, and you're seeing him go out there, and you're seeing him lay hits. He's second on the team in hits for this game. Let the let the boy off his chains and just yeah. send him out. I think I think the talent that Richie has is too good for the fourth line. I don't think you, you want to talk about stifling somebody's talent. Put Richie on the fourth line because he's playing with people like Fiddler and Moen. Yeah, they're both gritty players but Richie has this has he, he'll outscape them all the time and I'm and Fiddler and Moen are slow I hate to say it but they are slow yeah they can play hockey and they can hit and they can score but when you get a player like Richie that can just speed through and throw hits around and score he's better utilized with somebody like Ben or with Sagan or Spezza or Nachushkin for that cause they're going to be able to keep up with him, and that's utilizing your speed to your advantage. Yeah. Richie uh, finishes also with five shots on goal. Uh, he has one missed shot. The boy goes out there, he hits, and he shoots. Has he cashed in on a goal yet? No. But he does everything else right. And it's only a matter of time. I mean, only putting him out there for ten minutes... You're not giving him a lot of chance to showcase his skill. Roussel had a decent game, and Roussel has been playing good as of late, but I had much rather seen Richie getting Roussel type minutes than Roussel getting yeah, the time that he It's did. like I was saying last night, like I get it. Veteran presence on the team, cool. People people with ten plus years in the league, cool. Richie is the best player for Eve's spot on the top line. I don't care if you want a veteran presence on the first line. Eve's is he he's a third line at best. Cool, he has great time whenever he plays with Sagan and Ben, you know. He helps score goals, but Richie is the talented future. Let's play him with our talent. Yeah. No, I agree. Stars go down 4-2, to two, but they battle back. You see Spezza getting his second goal, and then you see Jamie Benn getting that tip uh, late in the game. When Shattenkirk gets that second goal, did you think, man, there's no way the Stars are going to be able to fight back, or did you think, well, you know, this is the Stars and they can score goals? Uh, I mean, you know, those mixed emotions come in where I think I had both those thoughts going through my head. It's like, well... Because you see it when they get that that third goal scored on them, they kind of seem like they just didn't care anymore. But then you see Spetz's line going out there, and they're working hard. So you think, oh, well, they're working hard. Well, maybe that'll, that'll work to the rest of the team. And you see the team starting actually trying more, and then Spetz gets his goal, and then it's like, oh, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, Dallas is able to cash in on – a late power play. I mean, they use it to their advantage. Their special teams again. Dallas is on top, and that was something that they weren't getting, you know, a few weeks ago, or hell, even last month. Their special teams were the worst through like a stretch there, and to see them kind of bouncing back, it seems like things are starting to work a bit better. But they continue to do that drop pass thing, and. I, I'm not even going to talk, <laughs> talk about that. I really wish they would stop doing it. But going into overtime. Game's tied up going into overtime. And Sagan and Hemsky have that chance. And then it goes right back down and uh, St. Louis is able to score. What did you see on that goal that you thought should have just been better. Well, to start out overtime, poor choice of lines. Right off the bat. I do not agree with putting Eakin out there with Ben and Goligoski. I mean, okay, I understand Goligoski, but Eakin, mm, just because he scored a goal in the game, you know, 
I wouldn't put him out there first with Finn. I would have put either Sagan or Spezza or Dechushkin or hell, Richie. I mean, I just, I don't, and then you put Sagan out there with Hemsky. Like, where is Spezza? The guy scored two goals in the game. Why are you not putting him out there when he needs to be out there? He is a playmaker and a leader on this team. He gets shit done. Put him out there. And then that goal. I mean, what did we spend like two minutes in our own zone with just St. Louis passing the puck to the point? Having free reign to do whatever they want? Stars deserve to lose. I'm sorry. Yeah, the the overall you know lackadaisical play in their own zone in the overtime you know where's the pressure you know it's 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 man on man it's three on three they don't have the advantage there should be a man on every single person just like uh in montreal where is the pressure like i think uh petrangelo had like 20 seconds just to be like okay well i'm gonna pick where i'm gonna shoot i'm gonna skate in just a little bit and throws the puck on net that's that's the soft goal that niemi cannot give up you know it's it's not all on niemi there should have been pressure there should have been someone in the lane it seemed like spezza was trying to guard two people what were the other two stars doing Where's where's the pressure? Grow some balls and play aggressively and three on three. It's like you said, it's man on man. There's two people like halfway to the net, halfway to the blue line, and Shattenkirk just or Petrangelo just he does what he wants. You that's not hockey. That's basically just giving him the goal to say, We don't care, score your goal, we're just gonna come back and play another game later. Like that, it it frustrated me so much to see that after they battled back to score those two goals and to end the game on that note, like that was just pathetic. Well, on that note, what rating did you give this game? I gave it. I'll give it a B minus, mainly because. Spezza scored his two goals. It keeps the streak alive. They're big hits. They played with this team until overtime. This game could have been won, but Dallas was just too much of a pansy to go out there and play aggressive. I gave it a B. I liked the fight back. I liked uh, getting the points, turnovers, and soft goaltending ultimately holds this team back. In this, no pressure in the overtime. They they seemed they seemed to want this win, but not enough. The Stars play the LA Kings next game. What kind of uh, predictions do you have for that one? LA Kings play a similar style to, to the Blues. They hit, and they let their defense keep them in the game, and their goaltending. You know they need to keep Kopitar in check. They need to keep Dowdy in check. But other than that, if the Stars don't come to play physically, I ex I expect it'll be a rout for Los Angeles. So I'd say if Los Angeles wins, it'll be 5-2. to two. But if Dallas comes out and shows that they have grit and they're aggressive and they play with them, I think it'll be, we'll say, 3-1. to one. Hmm. I agree that uh, LA plays a similar style. They're big, they're they're mean. They play really well. They're having a good resurgence over there. Uh, I think, but I think if LA wins, it's going to be on the back of Quick. So I like a score of three to two for Dallas and a score of four to one for LA. So that's the discussion. Be sure to subscribe, share wherever you would like, leave any kind of feedback down below, hit that like button. Anything helps this show grow. Remember, this is a show for fans, by fans, and as always, tune in next time.